Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 18th of November and this quick look at the week ahead with me, Michael Hewson. And we've certainly had a lot to digest this week. Um, obviously, we've had the autumn statement from Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt. We've also had a host of Fed speakers um, talking up the prospect that the Fed is nowhere near done when it comes to rate hikes. Pretty much know that anyway. Um, but was, there's also the fact that we've seen a slightly more, and I'm not going to say dovish narrative, but I think certainly a much more um, realistic narrative when it comes to how many rate hikes are likely to be coming down the pipe um, over the course of the next few months. There is an acceptance, I think, on the part of a number of Fed policymakers that the rate hikes are going to be slightly lower in terms of they're not going to be 75 basis points. They're probably going to be 50 or 25. I think the expectation is for December that we are going to get 50. And certainly, I think in the context of events that we've got this week, um, we've got the latest Fed minutes. We've got various flash PMIs from um, the UK, Germany and France, German Germany IFO business climate, as well as a couple of earnings numbers from King Fisher and Zoom. The earnings season is slowly winding down now. So um, the, the narrative around earnings is slowly giving way to um, a wind down into the holiday season because we've got Thanksgiving coming up in the US on the 24th of November. Before I move on to next week's events, however, I think it's important to look back at the events of the last few days. And the overarching narrative um, this week has been, I think, of a slight consolidation in the US dollar after the declines that we've seen over the course of the past um, a few days, couple of weeks. Um, but we've also seen, I think, a consolidation lower in bond yields. Um, and I think that is obviously important. It's feeding into a hope, I think, rather than an expectation that energy prices will continue to come down. Certainly, we're seeing that in the context of oil prices. They are starting to consolidate at the bottom end of their recent range, which I think is a good thing when you consider the reaction to this week's autumn budget from the Chancellor of the Exchequer. So let's talk about that because I think the market reaction to it was fairly benign, which I think is surprising when you consider that it painted a very bleak outlook for the UK economy. I mean, the Bank of England was already predicting that the UK is facing a two-year recession. And earlier this week, we saw that CPI rose to 11.1%, uh, a 40-year high. I mean, core CPI um, was steady at 6.5%. So certainly price pressures are likely to remain a constant irritant to consumer sentiment over the course of the next few years. And certainly when you look at the measures that were announced in the budget, um, that I think is unlikely to change any time soon. The OBR, the Office of Budget Responsibility, predicted that the UK is already in recession, although they upgraded this year's GDP forecast to 4.2%, but they downgraded 2023 from 1.8% to minus 1.4%. I mean, that's a significant shift before getting a rebound in 2024. Um, their inflation forecast, 9.1% for this year, coming down to 7.3% in 2023, while unemployment is expected to rise to 4.9% in 2024 from the 3.6% th level that it is now. But that wasn't the real kicker. What was the real kicker was that the OBR predicted that living standards could fall by as much as 7%. Disposable, consumer disposable incomes are going to shrink quite significantly. Um, over the next two years, and house prices could fall by 9%. Uh, 
Um, well, when I look at some of the tax measures, I think there's a temptation to think that that's a little bit optimistic. Freezing tax thresholds for five years to 2028 is obviously one case in point. Obviously, lowering the 45% um, tax rate from 145,000 to 150,000 to 125, again, that's a significant, uh, that will have a significant impact on the higher percentile of UK taxpayers. But it's the freezing of tax thresholds that I think is going to do the most damage. Um, because if you've got inflation running at well above 5% for the next three or four years, and you're freezing tax thresholds, which normally rise in line with inflation for the next five years, then the real terms hit to consumer incomes is going to be quite substantial. At the same time, you're raising the energy price cap from two and a half thousand to three thousand. Yes, you are giving help to some of the a lot of the more vulnerable households, but you're also intending to raise fuel duty in March next year by 12p a litre. It's funny that he didn't mention that in yesterday's statement, but it's in there. Um, then. I think it's going to be very, very difficult to, um, or for anyone for that matter, to have a significant amount of disposable income. So it's a fairly bleak outlook. And I think the only silver lining is the hope that energy prices continue to fall. Certainly natural gas prices have been on the decline and are trading in and around their lowest levels quite some time. The December contract here, we can see that it's down below 300, um, which is encouraging. The hope is that it will continue to languish around those levels. It's still well above the levels it was um, 12 to 18 months ago, but at least it's coming in the right direction. And it's certainly well below the levels in August. And I think that's one of the big, I think that's one of the things that's really got me scratching my head about the severity of the tax rises that have been imposed within this budget because ultimately energy prices are lower, gilt yields are lower, sterling's higher, so markets have implicated. Was there really any need to go as hard into a slowdown on tax rises and spending cuts? The good thing is that you didn't cut capital expenditure or capital investment. Um, Northern Rail is going ahead. They're going ahead with size we'll see. I think what was more concerning, I think more than anything else, was that I think the case for HS2 between Birmingham and London is flimsy at best. And you could have saved an awful lot of money by scrapping that while keeping the Northern, the Northern, the Northern Powerhouse Rail, the East West Rail, um, as well as size we'll see. But there was no mention of, um, SMRs, singular modular reactors, which are mini nuclear reactors, which is a new technology being developed by Rolls Royce. No mention of that. That would have probably been a quicker solution. He's hammered the oil and gas sector with a further windfall tax, moving it out from 25 to 35%, making an effective tax rate of 75% on all UK profits. Now, while BP and Shell can probably absorb that quite well, slightly different matter for the UK oil and gas providers like Harbour Energy and Inquest, whose share prices took a little bit of a dive. And it's not really surprising, given the fact that most of their profits come from the North Sea oil and gas basin. And if you want to, these companies to develop new natural gas resources as an interim measure to um, transition to renewables, then you've got a funny way of going about it. So there was nothing about um, encouraging investment in new wind farms, in you know, offshore wind, onshore wind, um, rather than taxing the electricity generators, a 45% uh, windfall tax on their excess profits. We do know that the excess profits will only kick in over and above 75 pounds per megawatt hour. So at least we get some clarity on that, but nonetheless, it's still, pretty much hangs out a sign to say that 
yeah, you can make money, but if you make too much, we're going to whack you with a windfall tax. And, you know, it's not given the fact that these sorts of investment decisions generally take years to pay off. It sort of sends out a message that um, the UK is not particularly open to business. Having said that, talking about relaxing Solvency 2 rules to encourage life insurers to invest in infrastructure projects is welcome. The big question is whether or not it unlocks an awful lot of um, capital from the likes of Legal and General and Aviva to allow them to invest in UK infrastructure projects. Um, so, you know, pretty bleak outlook. Retail sales for October came in at 0.6%. Um, so, you know, that's, that's encouraging. But ultimately, I think the next couple of years are going to probably be very, very challenging for the likes of the retail and services sector of which the UK economy makes up around about 65, 70%. So, um, yeah, it's um, it's not a pretty picture. Hopefully, once things have settled down a bit, March, April next year, perhaps the, the Chancellor will see fit to implement a bit of a relaxation in some of the measures that he announced today. We're assuming, of course, that um, the measures announced today are set in stone for the next five years. If the outlook improves, that may well not be the case. But certainly for the here and now, um, it's a pretty it's a pretty bleak outlook. It's not a particularly current and encouraging outlook. Um, so what's coming up? Well, we've got Fed minutes, UK flash PMIs, German and France flash PMIs, um, Germany IFO business climate. It's a fairly light week um, as we head into Thanksgiving and the end of November. Um, got a couple of notable earnings announcements from B&Q owner Kingfisher and Zoom. But uh, over, other than that, there's really not that much um, to really get your teeth into. One notable item out earlier this week was James Bullard of the St. Louis Fed. We put the cat amongst the pigeons a little bit yesterday by articulating um, his opinion that perhaps the Fed terminal rate could actually go as high as between five and seven percent if inflation um, continued to persist at the current high levels that it currently is at at the moment. Now, obviously, that's quite a significant increase from the terminal rate that the markets are currently pricing at four and a half. Um, and it did prompt a little bit of a bid to the dollar as well as a little bit of a bid to US 10-year yields. And we can certainly see that in this daily chart here with that sharp rebound there. Nonetheless, we still look as if we're going to close lower on a weekly basis on US 10-year yields. And certainly, I think while it was a bit of a surprise to hear Bullard talk in such hawkish terms, from the underlying narrative that we've heard from other Fed speakers, they're not thinking along those lines. Yes, quite conceivably, the terminal rate could go to 5% over the course of the next 12 months. But for the here and now, certainly in looking at CPI and PPI, it is coming down. And while it's coming down, the Fed will continue to hike 50 basis points in December pretty much priced in. We're probably not going to get 75. It's going to be 50. And then if the Fed is data dependent and inflation continues to fall back, as it did in the PPI numbers earlier this week and the CPI numbers the week before, then it could well be that 5% terminal rate will be very much an outlier. It's certainly an outlier in terms of Bullard's comments, and he's the only one making that argument. We've heard the likes of Fed Chair Lael Brainerd earlier this week are talking about um, a slowing of the pace of rate rises may soon be appropriate. Certainly 50 basis points does appear to be the consensus call for December. It's going to be the consensus call also for the ECB, the European Central Bank. There's a number of policymakers there pushing the case for not a 75 basis point hike in, in December, but a 50 basis point hike in December, and that's entirely sensible. And we are still struggling at around about the 200 day moving average on Euro dollar. We have seen a strong move higher. We did see a spike up above um, 
the 200 day moving average on those PPI numbers earlier this week, um, which came in um, below expectations and obviously has prompted um, expectations or hopes of a Fed pivot. We're not going to get a Fed pivot. We're just going to get a slower pace of rate hikes so 50s, 25s and what have you. So um, at the moment, while we're below the 200 day moving average, we could well see euro dollar drift back down. Certainly the more dovish noises that we're hearing from a number of ECB policymakers would appear to suggest that the next move is likely to be 50. And we're probably going to get 50 from the Bank of England as well. We could actually, given the fiscal squeeze that the, the Chancellor is um, implementing on the UK population, get 25. But I think if you want to be taken seriously as a central banker, I think what we'll get is 50, 50, 50. So 50 Fed, 50 ECB, 50 Bank of England. Maintain the status quo. And it's really a question of what do we get in 2023? The here and now, Euro dollar does look a little bit toppy anywhere near above near around 104. And as such, until we break above 104, we could well drift back down here. And certainly the oscillator is looking a little bit overbought. It's a similar sort of story for cable, um, looking slightly better bid, but again, finding resistance at 120, uh, between 119.85 and 120. We need to break above 120, hold above 120, and get through the 200 day moving average in a similar way to euro dollar to signal that potentially a bottom is in and we're not going to see further declines. But again, looking at 120 on cable, 104 on euro dollar, that a break above that could well signal further dollar weakness. So I'm keeping a close eye on that. Dollar yen, again, a decent proxy for dollar strength or weakness. We did break below 140. We went as low as 130. 767, 137.65. We are starting to consolidate in and around here, the, these levels here. Decent resistance around about 141. If we break above 141, then we could well head back towards the 50 day moving average. Um, certainly is looking a little bit oversold in the short to medium term. But I think, you know, unless something materially changes or the Bank of Japan signals a pivot on its yield curve control, then um, it, it, what we've seen over the course of the past few days does suggest that perhaps the top is in in dollar yen and we could see a drift back towards the 200 day moving average. We'll have to wait and see. Certainly my bias has shifted ever so slightly towards selling dollar strength on any move higher. And certainly that would be supported by the fact that equity markets are looking slightly better bid if we look at the S&P 500. But again here, we're hitting some very key resistance levels. The 200 day moving average on the S&P 500 um, around about here. And also it's notable that you've got a very sharp spike towards 4000 on the S&P, but we haven't as yet been able to consolidate above it. So again, some really decent numbers to get your teeth into here, ladies and gentlemen. 4000 on the S&P 500, 104 euro dollar, 120 cable. Yeah, all of these round numbers are significant, I think, in the wider scheme of things. And we need to pay close attention to them, um, particularly in it, given the fact they're all around the 200 day moving average. 12,000 on the NASDAQ, 100, again, round number. So um, we're, at some, we're at some very, very key points in the wider scheme of things when we're looking at financial markets. And it's certainly something that we do need to be aware of. And certainly when you're talking about technical analysis and you're looking at confirmation of a break higher or lower, if you want to see confirmation of a weaker dollar, we need to break above 104, we need to break above 120, we need to break above 12,000, we need to break above 4,000 on the S&P 500 to signal that perhaps a weaker dollar is on the way. At the moment, we're getting a similar sort of signal in gold. We haven't been able to break above the 200 day moving average on gold, which is around about $1,800 an ounce. We've actually fallen short. So we could see a little bit of a tightening in yields, a little bit of firmer yields, which could actually push gold um, down again and, uh, and, and firm the dollar up in the short to medium term. So as I say, there's quite some way to go when it comes to whether or not we're going to see 
this weaker dollar narrative confirmed and those key chart points will tell me an awful lot as to whether or not we can expect to see that play out as we head towards year end and December and obviously we then have the December payrolls numbers as well as a whole new set of inflation data before a very key Fed meeting which is in the middle of December. But certainly Brent crude is looking soft again back towards the bottom end of its recent range we can see that here not quite back at the lows that we saw in September but it is welcome that um, Brent prices are coming down the only fly in the ointment I think is going to be China at the moment COVID cases are rising there so we're not going to get a reopening anytime soon which should keep a lid on oil prices going forward if we look at the FTSE 100 again similar sort of story very much a range trade not really much to see on the FTSE 100 here but it is quite notable that it is struggling to really can sustain a move above 7,400 in the short to medium term. DAX is looking much more resilient um, but again we've seen a bit of a consolidation and we're currently struggling to get much above 14,500. I mean we could conceivably argue this is a bit of a flag formation starting to form here and if the dollar continues to weaken we could well break higher towards 15,000. Certainly think there's scope for that but at the moment the DAX is the only index out of all the other indices that we've looked at that has shown any evidence that it's in any inclined to break out. Euro sterling it's like watching paint drive dry drive dry like watching paint dry um, fairly well offered above 88 fairly well bid around 86.70 that's the range of it and I don't think that's likely to change any time soon. In terms of earnings numbers next week we've got Kingfisher, um, B&Q owner, hasn't had a particularly great run of it this year, it is approaching the 200 day moving average, we've seen a fairly decent rebound off the October lows um, but I think the only, the only sort of positive or that particular business is the Polish business has gone from strength to strength. Um, the outlook for Q3 was encouraging initially in the wake of their Q2 numbers, like the like sales were down by 0.7. Now that could well deteriorate further if recent retail sales data has been any guide and could put four year guidance under threat. So it'll be very interesting to see whether or not they guide lower on four year guidance. That was unchanged back in September at between 730 million and 770 million pounds for full year profits. So keep an eye on that. We could well see that shifted towards the downside. Um, Zoom video, again, um, seen a little bit of a rebound off the October lows, but um, it's, str it's struggling to fill the gap that we saw when it gapped lower in. August. Disappointment over its Q3 guidance um, when it issued its Q2 numbers. Um, Q3 revenues are expected to remain steady at 1.1 billion. Profits are expected to fall to 82 cents a share. For the full fiscal year, Zoom says it sees full year revenue back down to 4.39 to 4.4 billion dollars and profits of $3.66 to $3.69, which was down from around about $3.75. Um, Zoom is blaming a slowdown in its online business as fewer people took advantage of its online service against the backdrop of increased competition from Microsoft Teams and Cisco Systems WebEx service. Okay, so I think that's pretty much it for this week. Ladies and gentlemen, hope you all have a great weekend and um, speak to you all same time same place uh, next week. Thanks very much for listening.